Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking at the last member of the bunch. This is part five, and the company burrows right after this. What is Batman, the Green Hornet, lost in space, voyage to the bottom of the sea, battle for the planet of the apes all have in common? I'll let you think about that, and I'll give you the answer at the end of the video. So Burroughs Corporation started out a long time ago, 1886. They were known as the American Arithmometer Company. They were based in St. Louis, Missouri, and the founder's name was was uh, William Seward Burroughs, who wanted had a vision. He wanted to invent an adding device, and he called it an adding machine. But he had a couple of things. First of all, there was a lot of skepticism around machinery at the time because people would sell things that didn't work and then take off, take your money and then leave. So he built his with glass sides so that other people could see what was going on inside the machine. You could see it was actually working and doing something. His machines had three other operands besides add. They also subtracted, and they multiplied, and they divide, uh, divided as well. So he had a little trouble getting it to work. And it took about a year later, uh, in 1897, or 1887, excuse me, that he received his patent for the adding machine. The company was quite successful. Uh, they sold lots and lots of adding machines. And the American Arithmometer Company changed their name to Burroughs Adding Machine Company in 1904. They moved the company at the same time up to Detroit, Michigan. I think the reason for that was, you know, Detroit was becoming a car manufacturing uh, mecca, and they had workers that were skilled in making precision machine parts. And so William, uh, and so the company moved up there in order to take advantage of that. They changed their name to Burroughs in honor of the founder who passed away in 1898. So I'm shown here, this is, the, uh, this is a 1920s model of uh, their adding machine. I actually have that model. That is, I still have it. Um, and it was, um, it was an adding and subtracting device, but it used, uh, it still uses two's complement in order to do subtraction. So... Uh, there's a key up on the left-hand side there to clear, but there's another one that you can use to actually perform two's complement, which allows you to subtract on the machine. I didn't realize that until my uncle, who had, he was a bookkeeper back in that time period, and had used that particular device, and he said, oh, I know how that works. Let me show you how to subtract on it. So I, I thought that was kind of cool. Anyway, that's one of the reasons why I kept In 1920s, Burroughs released a new kind of machine, the counting machine. This is a class 20 that's shown here, and this is where some of the rules and requirements for computing came from. It was these types of machines that were actually building ledgers. They were actually keeping a ledger uh, what was going on with the company rather rather than just have a thin strip of paper that had a column of numbers that and a, and a total or a subtotal. So those would then become the, some of the drivers for the type of requirements that computers were going to have to be able to perform. Also, as the business evolved, and Burroughs was very successful in doing this, the company grew to, uh, I think, fourteen or 15,000 employees. At this time, this would be around the, probably the late 30s, early 40s. It was just as people were coming out of the Depression, the bank started buying uh, a lot of equipment in order to help uh, speed up the type of operations that they needed to do. And so Burroughs responded by creating a new class of business machines. There was bookkeeping, banking, and building machines that they, they built. There was also payroll machines, so for those companies that needed that. Um, this is a bank, uh, one of the 14,000 banks that Burroughs had their machines into, and all of those people would be considered computers today. One of the other, one of the other oddball things that uh, Burroughs marketed was uh, Hey New Brother Laboratories made a Nixie tube, and Burroughs had need for those, and so rather than pay them for the patent, they just bought the company. And in 1955... <laughs> Nobody is really sure about the name where Nixie came from. 
But one, one explanation is this one. As it came for Nix 1, which meant numerical indicator experiment number one. I guess it's as good as any reason uh, to call it Nixie, but they were used in the Univac 1101, and Burroughs was selling them to Univac at the time in order to be able to place uh, in there. They were actually part of the Computer Council, I believe, that actually showed uh, the register. They could show register information or they could show data in the register. So. I don't know what other functions it did. I didn't work on Univac, especially not the 1101. That was way before my time. Uh, as as well as you would see them in clocks and frequency counters. You can still get them. They're still around. I think you can even buy a clock. Uh, they're probably, probably kind of expensive. But in 1950, Burroughs Adding Machine renamed itself the Burroughs Corporation, mainly because they saw a need for doing <laughs> to build a class of machines beyond the adding machine. They wanted to develop, either acquire or develop their own computer system. And so in 1956, they acquired Electrodata, which was a company I think was based in Pasadena, California at the time. And uh, yeah, and so Burroughs acquired them. The Electro, the Electrodata, there was a number of them that were perf- that were built. There was the 203, the 204, the 205. This is the, the Electrodata 205. It was called the Datatron. It had uh, vacuum tubes which I can't imagine what that thing was like, uh, trying to trying to figure out where what tube went out. <laughs> you may see it labeled as an Electrodata. You might see it labeled as a Burroughs. It depends on who actually shipped it, but they all shipped out of the same manufacturing uh, facility. The they did not the 205 did not have any kind of core memory or any memory at all. Uh, instead, it used drum memory for primary memory storage and. This is an example. This is actually one of the manuals for the 205. This uh, it showed it was a 24 tracks of 200 words each, and I think a word size back then on this was 10 bit, but uh, don't quote me. Uh, but it was 24 tracks of 200 words that rotated about 3,750 RPM. A full revolution of that disk took about 17 milliseconds, and so your average latency would be about half. That'd be about 8.4 milliseconds. That was pretty slow even for the time. So yeah, that wasn't the fastest drive in the world, but it worked well enough to be able to keep the machine working. Uh, Burroughs, uh, this was the first computer that was developed with the Burroughs name, the the Burroughs 220. Uh, And this had vacuum tubes and the core memory that Burroughs had had designed. So core memory came from Burroughs. Uh, and, of course, that was what Burroughs put into the ENIAC, so another invention. But shown here, you can see that it did have tape drives and it did have a console. It looks like there was either a console printer next to that person. I would imagine it probably had a high-speed printer of some kind, probably a card reader and a card punch as well, maybe even a, a paper tape. But, yeah, they were pretty primitive, and, yeah, that would be... That would be a personal computer because they only ran one thing at a time. Donald Knuth participated in the development of b and that would be the Burroughs Algebraic Compiler for the 220 machine. Um, there was other people that worked on it as well, uh, and that compiler was the basis of what Burroughs would use to develop uh, later on. So, yeah, so yeah it was, he wasn't the only one, though, as you'll see. In 1961, Burroughs in the, had a need for developing large systems. They had contracts from large, both military and civilian uh, businesses that needed more processing capability. And so Robert Barton designed the B5000. You may see it listed as the B5500. There was some, the initial machine was the B5000. There was some modifications that were made to it hardware-wise, and it became the B5500. So you may hear it called the B5500, the B5000, but the 5000 came first, the 5500 came later. But it was the first machine to run an operating system that was built using a high-level language, Algol. Uh, And so, yeah, that that was the first one to do it. The rest of them always had to use Assembler. So why would Burroughs use a high-level language? What what was that all about? Well, the problem was is that whenever you wrote an operating system and you wanted to move it, you wanted to change the hardware architecture and you wanted to move your operating system code onto that. If it was assembler, good luck. And if it had different memory mapping or more memory or less memory or yeah, it was you had to you had to rewrite the thing. You had different 
different code elements, different operands. And so, yeah, you, you would be basically just rewriting it. So Barton wanted to have it so it was written in a high-level language so that he at least had Algol in order to recompile on the other machine, no matter what it was. So they also brought a few other new additional concepts, such as reentrant programming. Now, reentrant programming is key to be able to handle multiple users on the same code. So you basically gave each user a reentrant view. So they basically had the same code but different data uh, in order for them to operate. So that's reentrant programming. Without that, we wouldn't have any any way to be able to handle multiple users on the machines. And this one did handle multiple users. Uh, stack architecture because it ran multiple programs at the same time. Uh, it had stack architecture, which basically, you'll, if you know anything about programming languages today, you'll find stacks being used both in the development of algorithms and also the way your compiler will generate the return from, say, a perform or a branch operation. So asymmetric multiprocessing uh, was obviously there because you needed multiprocessing in order to be able to run multiple programs at a time. All, and not only was the operating system written in Algo, but all of the system utilities, the backup programs, the control programs, the loader programs, they were all written in Algo. The other thing is that this design of the computer had a security mechanism which prevented unauthorized access to data. So unless you had the key, you could not read the data. It wouldn't, let, it wouldn't give it to you. Uh, it also implemented virtual memory. So you, for the first time, you could run programs larger than physical memory uh, space on the device. Uh, it also provided the first segmented memory model, which, of course, you need some way of being able to break up the program so that you could just have the part that was executing and make it a small part that was in memory. And then you would pull in the different segments of the program as you needed them. Uh, and that would then allow more space and allow it to share additional programs, uh, allow the memory to be shared by additional programs. There's other methods besides segmented memory. I'm not going to get into all that. But, uh, but Burroughs did something else kind of weird for the time and for and still today probably uh, is that up until this time software engineers developed the operating environments or executive programs in a black box they 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 didn't have a clue what hardware this was going to go on to until the hardware showed up and then uh oh this isn't going to work uh, or the same reverse, the hardware people would show up with the hardware and the software people would go, Ooh, oops, that hardware is not going to work. So Burrow said, no, we don't want any of that nonsense. You, you two are going to have to work together. I don't know what, uh, what kind of, what kind of you know, infighting went on above uh, and up at the upper management levels because software engineering was in a different, they reported to a different vice president than the hardware guys did, so... But eventually those merged, and I, I think that was the reason why they could, they could do development on machines faster. They had input from the software developers. The software developers had input from the hardware developers, so they could make the code optimized for the hardware. And I remember one time I was talking to one of the, uh, both the hardware and the software designer for one of the small systems out in, this would have been in Goleta, California and uh, was talking to them and and the software guy goes oh that hardware that new hardware it isn't fast it's slow he said the only reason why it runs faster is because we optimize for the for that for that machine if we left uh, the code the same and, and of course you know they immediately got into an argument it was funny I walked away what uh so what is this algo all about the b5000 version of algo was called algo 60 which was a standard. Uh, and this would be the 1960 version of the standard. Uh, it came up from Burroughs' work on it came up because C.A.R. Hare did a lot of the early coding. He he went out to Pasadena, so I'm guessing he probably worked on the 205. I don't think he worked on the 220 because that was the the Algol compiler already existed. Knuth came out and made improvements to it. Uh, so I think C.A.R. had already done his thing. He would worked on Elliot Algol for Burroughs and got it up and working. Uh, and then, so the other side comment, if you're wondering where the begin and end construct came from, it came from Algol. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, I almost forgot. Yeah, it was, it's still the fastest compiler I have ever used. 
Uh, I have never seen any anything could compile as much code in as short a time as Algol can. It is just screaming fast. These two gentlemen, Nicholas Worth and C A R Hare, again got together. They could, they collaborated, and what their hope was, they had a whole bunch of ideas for what Algol should become, and so they developed they co developed Algol W, which would have been you know kind of a uh, a pre acceptance release, and then submitted it in 1966 to become part of the Algol 68 standard. Unfortunately, it was rejected. It is too bad. The reason I say it's unfortunate because I this is opinion. This is just opinion. Uh, I think that what those guys had proposed for Algol would have taken it into the business. Uh, and I think what happened to Algol, uh, because as once again complexity for the Cobalt for the Algol, excuse me, the Algol 68 standard won over simplicity and power uh, because their version of the compiler. It was it, the changes were simple but powerful, and uh, what we ended up with in Algol 68 was yeah what we would call a nightmare. So it's too bad that though, that they didn't win out. I, I know that I know I've heard stories about the arguments that went on during that meeting, but yeah, to no avail as as always. It's just human nature. I mean, you give people two choices: make it simple, make it complex, take the complex. It's got to be better, right? And it's not. <laughs> It's not. It's not. Stack processing, uh, this was a FUD item that IBM used to always do anytime they figured out that Burroughs was in the middle of a bid uh, with one of, and they were competing with. So they would step up and say, well, we rejected the idea of using stack architecture a long time ago because it's too slow. Uh, that's what they would tell the customers. And so, yeah, they felt that keeping the data as close to the CPU was better because it made things faster. Well, yeah, I won't argue with that. You know, what they're saying is exactly true. Uh, so as it turns out, stack architecture is still used today. A lot of programming languages use it. A lot of, a lot of systems, uh, operating systems are based on it because it's the basis of a, a branch and return functions. So uh, yeah, so it's still in use. And yeah, keeping the data as close to the CPU, sure. Cache memory makes a hell of a lot of sense. And uh, so they're both right. I mean, so, yeah. I don't know why they were even arguing about it, or why IBM thought it was an issue to begin with. It just the medium system. So you had large system, medium system, small system, and then you had the small business division, which had the B90, B80, B800 size machines. But so I'm not going to talk about those. I didn't work for them, so I worked for large accounts. So I dealt with these. The medium system. This these were manufactured in the old Electro Data plant in Pasadena. Uh, the plant by that time had been expanded because the business had grown. So these machines represented the core of the Burroughs business class computers, and they were designed to run COBOL. Uh, one of the things that that the medium system designers did was when they, this is, remember, the software and hardware guys developed together. And so what they did was they said, hey, we got COBOL as a language which has all of these verbs in it, why don't we translate them directly to an assembler, an assembler operand? So that if I say move, it goes to MOV. If I say add, it goes to ADD. If I, I mean, and a lot of the languages at the time, you would see COBOL translate into four, five, seven, 20, 25 assembler statements in order to accomplish the verb. Um, Burroughs didn't want that. And so you ended up with a very fast and efficient machine. And I remember one time, <laughs> it just made me laugh. IBM, their IBM said, I happened to be at a customer that had these machines, the 4890. They, in fact, they had two of them. And, uh, and I was up there t uh, working on helping them do something. I don't remember what it was. But the IBM salesman comes strolling in. And he walked in and, and he, he was talking to the, the operator who was also the DP manager, and uh, and he said, "Hey, um, I'm I'm going to tell you about our this great new machine. I don't even remember what it was. It'll run 15 jobs at a time. It's amazing." And and uh, <laughs> the uh, DP manager, he looked at him. He just kind of laughed, and he said, "Oh, let me show you. Let me show you the Burroughs B4890." And he walked him over to the council, and he said, "How much is yours?" And he and he said. Oh, it's this much money. You said, oh, well, this one's $50,000 less. 
And and he pulled up the screen and he said, go ahead and you can count how many jobs and machines are running. I think it was 35 or something at the time. And the, and the IBM guy just kind of tucked tail and kind of slinked out. It was hilarious. Um, probably got fired because he, he <laughs> IBM would have tolerated that kind of nonsense. But the small system uh, was quite different. So this one, it had elements from the large system, but the designer, W.T. Wilner, I, I think w, uh, Wayne, Wayne T. Miller, I think I was just a genius. So he, he didn't particularly like my Neumann architecture-based machines. In fact, he hated them so much that he swore he would never design a computer that was based on them. Uh, he just thought that they, I think it was something about that they were protozoic dinosaurs, and yeah, and he just thought that they were. Yeah, it's a time pass when you know. So yeah, it was just holding us back. So he did not design this machine around von Neumann architecture at all. And this was in 1972. So the B1000, yeah, by any any, they're advanced even by today's standards. Uh, first of all, they had micro. They were micro programmable machines. There was no assembly at all in that machine because you did not touch the hardware. Um, it also had bit addressable memory because it was meant to run multiple uh, computer languages at the same time. It, it had a form of pipelining, uh, although they didn't call it pipelining. I, I forget what it was called, but it, it, it was a primitive form of pipelining. Official pipelining didn't come until later, so... It did do look-ahead processing, and there was something that did like a look-aside uh, operation as well. But again, these were primitive by today's standards. Um, they also introduced variable micrologic, or VML. VML could remap the processor to optimize performance for a variety of computer languages. So... One of the problems that you may, that you, if you grew up in this era, you probably encountered was you probably had some Fortran jobs that were left over from whenever. You probably had some COBOL jobs that were built because that was the language of choice for business. And you may have had some system programs that were running as well in order to do different things like manage the terminals or whatever. So, um, VML would map the performance of the machines to the programming language, whereas other computers where you had a monolithic uh, piece of hardware where you were just running uh, basic machine code, those could not map. And so you ended up wasting memory. So if you had, uh, say, the multiple of your word size wouldn't divide into Fortran's 40 word if it was Fortran 4 or 48 word if it was Fortran 77, then you wasted memory and it took longer to load and there was always conversions that were going on or translations that were occurring that would take things longer and longer to run. So there would be differences in the way the code ran depending upon the optimization uh, of the machine to whatever programming language it was written for. So Burroughs didn't want that. What they wanted was, I wanted to have a, a, a similar experience running, let's say, the same algorithm, whether it was written in BASIC or COBOL or RPG or Fortran or ALGO. They wanted it to run about the same. And I remember benchmarks from the time that, you know, we would see a second difference sometimes between the BASIC and COBOL and RPG and Fortran and ALGO, but it, most of the time they would be dead on. They'd be 10 seconds each on, on the particular run. But, um, yeah, there was no penalty due to the language differences. So what the heck did they do? Well, before I talk about this, uh, the, the way they did this was they interpreted. Uh, they created an ideal machine called the, uh, the system state machine or the borough state machine. And then the programming languages mapped into... Uh, an interpreter that so they would write interpreted code and the interpreter would interpret for the hardware. So you didn't have an assembler that you had access to. There was probably something that acted like an assembler, but uh, but you didn't have access to it. So the compilers were written in SDL2. That says SDLC, but SDLC was the system definition language compiler. And so, yeah, so that wrote the compiler and that generated the intermediate code that the machine ran. And then you ran, then you wrote the actual interpreter in MIL. 
And that created the mapping between whatever language it was and whatever hardware needed. So and that MIL was, I don't think it was Algol. It was, it was a strange language. I mean, that's, it's not assembler. <laughs> Definitely not assembler. It's a high-level language. I don't even remember what it stood for. I think it was uh, multi-programmable, multi-pro, multi-program uh, interpreted language or something like that. I probably have it totally wrong. It's been a long time since I worked around MIL, and my my mind has forgotten a lot of that. So I do remember, though, I, I was talking to a customer, potential customer. They, they were interested in running... Uh, their business on the B1000 because some of their customers had and they they had seen uh, they had been invited in and they had kind of seen it run and they were impressed so but the DP manager was kind of an old school guy he he came to me and he goes he he had to be something like this this isn't exactly what he gave me but they said I want to run assembler on the machine and, and I and I and I said there isn't an assembler on the machine and he said, I don't care. I, I want to run assembler on the machine. Show me how to do that. And I was like, well, I can show you what it does. And and I tried to take it from his standpoint, which was a mistake, right? Because I was trying to explain how this thing worked and put it in terms that, that the machine understood, but not him. He didn't get it. And so, yeah, sometimes advances in technology are just too difficult for people to understand when they're locked in their own world view of how things should work, if you can get them unlocked out of that view, you can show them what the benefit is over what they're doing. But until you can get that to happen, you it's a no sale. So I said, wait, wait a second. So I, I had gone through the SDL stuff with him, and he said, no, that's a high-level language. And I showed him MIL, and he said, that's closer, but it's still a high-level language. I said, I know that. So I said, okay, I'll tell you what. I'm going to have you sit down with the designer, one of the designers. I'm going to bring him out. I'm going to sit him down with you because, I, you know, I really wanted him to understand this. It wasn't a matter of you're right, uh, you're wrong, and I'm right. I, I wasn't ever like that. It was more of, hey, I genuinely want you to understand how this thing works because the advantages of it are quite different from what you're used to. And so the designer came out, and they sat down, and I think the guy got it finally. He finally understood, you know. Oh, okay. I see the advantages. Now they didn't buy it. They didn't, they didn't buy it. They didn't buy the computer. But that's all right. At least it was, you know. I achieved my goal, which was for him to understand the thing. Um, so, and we had those three machines up until 1984, and Burroughs wanted to consolidate, of course, to save money, right? You want to have there. You want to consolidate, get down to a, a, a singular architecture because we were building three. They were designing for three, you, so you got everything in triplicate, right? Triplicate R&D, triplicate uh, facilities for manufacture, triplicate logistics <laughs> and part storage. So so they wanted to reduce that and create these machines called the A-Series, which went from a small system model from A1. It was like a, like that was even encompassing over the, the B80, B90 size machines all the way up to the A17. I think there were some other machines that came in after, but I don't. I wasn't there at the time, so I don't know what those were. But they merged all three of those business classes into one architecture, and it was the large system architecture. They created some applications and some code that would allow the ease of migration of both the data and the software uh, over to the A-Series without having to spend a lot of time making it work. It, it, it didn't have translators. It was... You ran it through a filter and it changed it. So they introduced the actual first pipeline, the real first the pipeline in computers in 1984, both on a single processor, the A9, and a dual processor, the A10. Uh, and those would have been in the well, what had previously been called the medium system uh, yeah, class of machines. They also implemented e mode uh, beta, which was an expanded. Uh, the A9 and A10, those two machines, the A9 and A10, were the first to implement e mode uh, beta, which was an ability to address expanded memory. So, yeah, you could, for the first time, address memory beyond the word size of the machine. Basically, that's all it means. September 1986, Burroughs merged with Sperry to form Unisys. So, uh, you have the 2200 on the bottom and the A series on top.
There was a recession in the 1990s that almost put Unisys under. The problem was they were still carrying a $3.8 billion debt load from the purchase of Sperry. And at the same time, Unisys was hit with a, de- uh, with a loss because of declining sales in the, in, in the sales of, man- of the mainframes. They were tapering off. It was across the board, not just for Unisys, but IBM as well. The, the time of the mainframe was over. So what did Unisys do to survive? Well, the first thing they did was they canceled the dividend for common stock. And they took that money and they plied it against the debt load and poured some of it into R&D. They then refocused their effort away from the mainframe and onto high-end Windows servers. So they already had a chip architecture that the Acery was built around, so they could easily run Windows code on it. They just had it, they just had to get it, you know, working. <laughs> so they and they poured more money into R and D to develop machines around this high-end Windows server market. And they needed to cut that debt load back. So, starting as the American Arithmometer Company, Burroughs Innovations and Sperry continued right up to the modern day. And that's the key success for any company, is that if you don't innovate, you die. Yeah, somebody will just innovate you right out of business. And that's what almost happened during the mainframe era. I, I know that there was, there was some snobbery, I guess, by the time when the small machines came up. I, I, I do remember people saying, oh, the x86, oh my God, that thing is a toy. You know, these are powerful machines. These these will never be replaced. Wrong. In answer to the question, what does Batman, the Green Hornet, lost in space? Voyage to the bottom of the sea and battle for the planet of the apes. There's more of these, by the way. All I have in common. Batman 60 Bat Computer was a Burroughs. It was a Burroughs 205. The uh, box with the lights on the top with the white lights, that's the console for the Burroughs 205. The one they're standing next to is the power distribution panel for the 205. Yeah, the machine, those lights are not the same as the 205, though, because the 205 had, uh, it had, I think, neon bulbs. I've seen a a few of them in the museum, but I've never seen one actually operating. But um, they did have neon bulbs, which I understand didn't show up well on camera. So... Some of the, I guess, some of the special effects people took the council apart, ripped out the neon bulbs and replaced them with white lights, and then they would kind of randomize the pattern of lights that it would appear on the screen by wiring up, I don't know, maybe eight, uh, eight or nine channels, something like that. <clears throat> and then they had a simple cam that rotated that they could, you know, move the individual cams around so they could get different different patterns of lights coming on and going off. But, yeah, that's what, that's, they were actually empty. Uh, yeah, but they just generated random light patterns. Uh, either the console or the tape drives would show up in movies. Failsafe had the, t- the tape drives, and, it, uh, and, uh, and, and then, yeah, the Green Hornet actually had the console. Boyd's to the Bob of Sea had the console and the tape drives, and uh, Lost in Space had... The both the the console and the tape drives too, I think Battle for the Planet of the Apes. The only part they had was the console, and it was stuffed behind a a a, a, a kitchen. Uh, I think it was behind the stove or something. Yeah, uh, that's all I had for today. Uh, so, one comment that I wanted to make before closing, so that you understand why I was doing this. This is not about nostalgia. I'm not nostalgic for those old machines. I'm proud of where we've been. But I'm not not pining for the good old days. Uh, the reason why I decided to do this was because there's a message here. Hopefully, you got that message, which is stagnation. And I have talked about this before. We are in a stagnated period. Uh, so, what are some things that we could be doing to improve things in the computer business? Well, there's always something that needs to be done. There's some inefficiency in any process. I don't care how long it's been running. Uh, even even <laughs> the uh, when I when I attended a, a talk by uh, she was Captain Grace Murray then, uh, who was the author of COBOL and also one of the first programmers on on uh, I think the Mark IV at Harvard. 
She also did work for the ENIAC, and she also did some work for Burroughs. But <clears throat> I, the one thing that she said was, the words of, of, of peril are the ones you hear that say, but that's always the way we've done things. Whenever you hear that, you know they need to do it. They need change. <laughs> if you ever hear that, but that's the way we've always done it. If you hear that, you know that they need change because if they're doing things the old way, then yeah, there's there's definitely improvement that could be made there. So, so that's all. I, that's the message I'm trying to impart to you. Look at some of the things that maybe these guys were doing. Maybe, and if you need more inspiration, go read uh, uh, Lick Litter's uh, book called Dream Machines. It's still around. You can still you can pick up a copy of it. It's still around, and read it. It's uh, it it was some of the early thought in, that went into what they wanted computers to do, and I think there's nobody talking about what we want computers to do. I think today we're trying to figure out well what else can we make money doing making computers do, but the if you look at the original researchers, they were trying to improve things. They were trying to make things better. I don't think we're trying to make things better anymore. <laughs> and I think in a lot of cases, we're stagnated. So anyway, that's all I had. I'm off my soapbox again. Uh, hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please like and subscribe. And hope to see you all again real soon. And bye for now. <laughs>